more, give us some practice. So watch for homework 11 to go online. And it'll be due Monday. Um, thank you. I don't think homework 11 will be that bad. I don't think it'll be a very tough one. Uh, but I did want to get a little bit more practice. We can still do a little bit more with solo that we haven't got to practice yet. And this model is relatively easy. It's a pretty easy, straightforward model. So we'll put some of this on there too. And again, I don't think it'll be too hard. All right, so anything else before we get going? <coughs> so I don't think we've really made anything, any headway into the aggregate expenditure model. Um, so that's where we gotta start. Uh, that's what AE stands for, the aggregate expenditure model. If you have a really old professor or a really old textbook, they will call it the Keynesian cross model. The aggregate expenditure model or the Keynesian cross model. And the reason we'll, you know, they call it the Keynesian cross model is as actually, you know, for the namesake. At the start of the semester, we started talking about the introduction of macro and why it was introduced, and we threw a name out there. We threw John Maynard Keynes out there. And, um, yeah, actually while he was writing and what he was saying and promoting was actually building this model. And one of the things that he was really adamant on was that, well, the economy is gonna be driven primarily by spending, which data seems to support. You know, again, consumption is our biggest measure of spending, um, and that makes up, what, uh, 65 or so percent of GDP. So he believed that spending is what drives the economy and consumption drives overall spending. That's the biggest component of spending. So he said, okay, well, the first thing we then need to do to actually model this is kind of come up with what determines consumption. So he believed if that was the most important thing, we gotta know what creates it. Um, and I think part of this we already know. I think we know that actually, I think we know the biggest determinant of consumption. Consumption, right, you buy stuff. What's the biggest determinant of you buying stuff? That you having money. So I think that was gonna be kind of our most important thing. This idea of income. Right, we've, we've called that why. <coughs> well, Kane said, well, we do have to make sure that we account that income well, isn't always what is on your check. And we've addressed this too. He said, I want to kind of view income only as disposable income. Um, I don't, I, you know, I think when I learned it, I think we used DI for disposable income. The book uses YD, you know, either one is totally fine. But I, I think that, you know, again, it's just how I learned it. It's kind of burned in my brain that I always think DI. Uh, but why do you? Yeah, whatever. Disposable income is the amount of income left over, the amount of income left over after any taxes. have been paid and or transfer payments and or transfer payments have been received. of income left over after any taxes have been paid and or transfer payments have been received. So again, we've talked about this, we just never put a math equation to it. And that's what chapter 10 does, right up early in the early part of the chapter. They effectively, and again, this is what, another reason why I like DI, I kind of like making it its own variable. They say that DI is equal to Y minus T plus TR where Y is income, T is taxes, and TR are transfer payments received. We've defined transfer payments earlier in the semester, so I won't formalize it, but just to give you a refresher, remember the transfer payments were gonna be things like welfare, social security, unemployment benefits, 
money that was taken out of one person's taxes and transferred to another consumer. So it's still the same thing. That was from earlier. We learned that when we did circular flows. Still means the same thing. Again, the textbook, again, I, I just like DI better, but if you follow along in the book, they say YD equals Y. And then I was like, oh, that's a little annoying. So uh, DI equals Y minus T plus TR. Okay, so if we wanted to model this, we could do so very easily. If we want to just kind of think about this equation and say, well, what happens if Y goes up to spending? consumption or other. Uh, this is pretty darn easy. You have more money, you probably spend more money. If people at higher incomes outspend people at lower incomes. Generally true? I, I think so. Which means, well, we have this nice upward sloping function that represents consumption. <coughs> and again, so far I don't think we're going too far out of the the realm here. The only thing now we have to ask is, where do I want to start it? And this is what Keynes looked at. He said that, yeah, consumption is primarily driven by income, but there's a bunch of other factors that determine consumption. Meaning there's other things out there that affect how much you can buy or how much you can spend besides income. That's how he phrased it. I kind of think about it in a, a slightly different way. It's still saying the same thing, but I think it's a little easier to think about it this way. If you have an income of zero, can you still buy stuff? Sure. Actually, some of you might have an income of zero. In fact, that would probably be a safe guess. There's some of you out there that don't have a job. Can you still buy stuff? Yeah. So how do you buy stuff then if your income is zero? Well, some of you worked over the summer and you saved up a whole bunch of money and now you're spending it. So effectively now your income is zero wasn't always. Right, so there could be some measure of past income. And if I just say, let's, uh, let's, yeah, let's even just scratch income out and call it past money. You don't have to actually scratch it out if you don't want to. But this is actually going to give us a, kind of a term. Meaning somehow in your past you acquired money. Whether it was from an old job, an old income, or it was because um, a rich relative left you a whole bunch of money, or whatever. We actually call this wealth. Um, it's only if you're curious, but we actually will not use the variable in modeling, so you don't have to write it down. They actually abbreviate wealth M, and I don't know why. <coughs> um, they, they couldn't pick W, because I guess we'd confuse it with wages, so they went with an upside down W. Um, I don't know. So uh, wealth, right? Yeah, absolutely. That could affect your uh, spending. Uh, let's see, what's another way that you could spend if you didn't have any income? Well, you could borrow it. I think a lot of you do that, and that's what your credit card is effectively doing. So we already have talked about the, the fact that your decision to borrow money is based primarily on the interest rate. Meaning if you borrowed money but you know it was a 65% interest rate, you aren't going to spend very much. You're going to cut back to, and only purchase things on your credit card that you absolutely had to. Okay, so we know that the interest rate is going to be a factor. He talked about some other possible variables that we could include here as well. Um, something like future expectations. <coughs> and, uh, you know, I'm just going to do dot, dot, dot. Because there's, of course, numerous other things. He wrapped all of this up into one essentially different kind of variable. He said any spending that comes from these other factors is what he called autonomous consumption.
autonomous consumption. <coughs> autonomous consumption is any spending that is independent of income. Any spending that is independent of income. So it's gonna be based on one of these other or not even other listed factors. So the book, again, I, I don't, this is I, overly confusing. The book uses C bar, so at some point where we would have an equation that says C equals C. Very annoying. Um, almost every book ever uses just lowercase a for autonomous consumption. Again, whichever one, I'm going to go towards this one because I, I just don't like how our book's equations at the end say y equals y plus c equals c, and it's like, wait, what? So I'm just going to use a. Um, but again, if you want to follow along exactly in the book, call it c bar. That's fine. So we have this factor that means effectively we can spend even if income is zero. Effectively, we still have some consumption, which if we then say, all right, well, I need to combine this graph with this statement, we can do so. We can say, all right, well, we know that it, it was pretty obvious, more income, more spending. So as Y rises, we still expect that upward slope. But now we have to concede that even if Y is zero, spending still occurs. So there would be some positive value on the spending axis right here. The distance from the origin to whatever spending we have is our autonomous consumption. After that, the theory still holds, the relationship still holds, more money, more spending. And we get some measure of consumption that, well, slopes up like we expect, but doesn't start at the origin. Okay, so, um, so that's kind of good. Now, now, I think we have another assumption to at least address, and Keynes, you know, of course, wanted to address all of these assumptions, is that, you know, typically I make my graphs this nice, pretty 45-degree angle line because I like, you know, just nice straight lines. Well, that actually has a context because the steeper this graph is, effectively it's saying that, well, even a small change in income means you jack spending up a lot. Think about what that would mean in terms of perspective, everyday life. Um, you make an extra 10 bucks an hour. Well, all of a sudden you're spending jacks up a lot. So you're like spending an extra 10 bucks an hour or close to it. Effectively, the slope matters to some extent in our model. The steeper the slope, the more, your more of your income you spend. Conversely, what would a flat slope mean, right? If I just hand erase this real quick, you don't have to draw it. What would a flat slope mean? Well, a flat slope means income goes up and I don't change spending. So, you know, slightly away from flat. Income goes up a lot and yeah, I only spent a tiny bit more. I got a $100 raise and I only spent one extra buck. So slope actually is kind of important in terms of understanding what our model looks like. The slope of the, con the consumption function shows what we call society's marginal propensity to consume. I'm gonna erase right here, but I'll leave some of that other stuff up just in case you're still backtracking. Let's see, I could probably do up to here. I'll leave that part for right now. I'll erase it in just a second, just in case you're catching up. Marginal propensity to consume. Back to easy abbreviations. We abbreviate that MPC. The marginal propensity to consume is the amount that consumption spending rises <laughs> Let 
when disposable income rises by one unit. So that's kind of the econ sounding definition, just to say marginal MPC is uh, basically how much of each dollar do I spend? If my income goes up by a buck, do I spend that entire buck? Do I spend one cent? Do I spend half of it? Whatever. How much does spending go up when income goes up? MPC is reported as a decimal meaning it has a range of zero to one. Where zero would be income goes up and I don't spend any of it. It would give us that flat function. And one would be 100%. Income goes up a dollar, I spend an extra dollar. Effectively giving us a vertical function. We don't expect either endpoint. We expect it to be somewhere in between there. Um, we'll put up a calculation for it in just a second. Let's just kind of talk again. Let's try to relate this to real life a little bit. Um, so first of all, real life. Um, and again, just kind of quick skim notes, if you will. It's something that you can just kind of get the gist of. So in terms of real life, um, we, we find that MPC has got a lot of variance in it um, by a lot of different factors. Uh, for example, we find that it varies by country. Um, we definitely tend to notice that industrial countries have a lower MPC than non-industrialized or agrarian countries. Um, and I kind of think that makes sense, because again, think about what an agrarian country is doing. They're producing food, they're buying food. If your choice of products is food, that incentive to save just doesn't, it's just not as strong, right? We talked about that a week or two or whenever ago that um, you, you, know, you don't just sit there and say, okay, well, I'm gonna kind of starve myself now so next year I can eat better. Well, because you might not make it to next year if you're starving yourself now. So that incentive to spend all your money on food is, is, is pretty strong. Where industrialized nations, we tend to see a couple of things. We tend to see one, higher incomes. We also see more product availability, which tends to lower price, um, at least in terms of relative price. Which means that, you know, if we only pretend we only bought food as well, you can buy enough food to last you the whole month and still have money left over which means you're more likely to save that money left over, lowering your marginal propensity to consume. You would say, you know, you would spend at a lower percent of your income. So we definitely find that industrialized countries um, have a little bit lower of MPCs. We also find that MPC has a life cycle. It changes, even in industrialized nations, it changes based on age of population. So let's kind of start your age approximate. Um, so like, you know, 20, 21, 22, you've just graduated college, you know, you've got that first job, whatever, maybe you're, you know, working through college, your MPC tends to be pretty darn high. Whenever you're starting out, you spend probably most of your income for a couple of reasons. You know, if it's your first job, your income's probably not that, you know, really high. I hope you all step out into a a great six, seven figure, whatever job, that would be amazing, but let's be honest, it's not gonna happen. You're not gonna just walk right into seven figures upon graduation. Um, instead, you're gonna have an entry level position, you're gonna make, you know, 50 or whatever, thousand dollars for a while. Your income's a little bit lower, your bills still exist, so what, six months after you graduate, you gotta start paying off your student loans. Um, your car, your apartment, or house or whatever, all those things still exist, which means it's probably gonna take a big chunk of your monthly paycheck. It's just kind of the nature of how it is. Your MPC is gonna be pretty high. As you age, what do you start doing? 
Well, you start saving for retirement, right? You're in your 30s, and you're in your 40s. Like that's the big words they want to use. Are you saving for retirement? Um, well, you, you actually are in a better position to save. Your income's probably higher. Even though you're probably spending more, right? You don't have an apartment, you now have a house, so you have a big old mortgage payment, right? You're spending more, but you still have more money left over every month. You're more inclined to save. You also start thinking about that retirement. I don't want to work forever. I better start putting some money away. We tend to notice that, you know, in the low 20s to mid 20s, MPC is really high. As soon as you hit that mid-20s to upper-20s threshold, MPC starts to go down a little bit. 30s, 40s, it's kind of really going down. You're spending at a lower percent. What happens as you continue to age? 50, 60, 70. We actually start noticing MPC going back up again. Once you're hitting like 60, 70, once you're 70 years old, what are you saving for? Don't. Because, you know, you don't know how much longer you're going to be around on this planet. So whatever you have built up in savings for your retirement, it's time to spend it. It's time to start going on trips. It's time to start, you know, like what my parents are doing, buying the grandkid everything that he possibly could want. Because he needs an Xbox One at a house he spends approximately one day a month at. But he's got an Xbox One and six games. Right, you're just going to start spending this money. You're also not taking in as much an income. If you're retired, you might still take in an income, Social Security. You know, so, I don't know, you're taking in four, five, six hundred bucks for that. Um, well, that's going to all go towards the bills. Your MPC starts to rise again. So in real life, we actually find that it kind of does have a life cycle. It goes high, low, high. For our purposes, for a class, we're just going to kind of assume that once we report it for society, it's just kind of an average. And that's actually true. That's what they do. Okay, what about some real-life values? We get some it depends. It actually depends on how you count it. Um, we've seen several reports of MPCs in the United States to be around 90 to 98 percent. Seems awfully high. Uh, yeah, it is. It probably means that they are counting spending on debt. Because that makes a difference, right? You can get into credit card debt, you're spending above your income. Which isn't technically, truly what MPC is meant to measure. It's meant to measure what of your income do you spend. So if we look at just truly what it's meant to measure, we find that it's probably a little closer to about 70% for you know, the United States. We, you know, as an average on society, we spend about 70 to 80 percent, somewhere in between that range. Um, we're not going to go into the realistic effects of it. We, you know, honestly, on all my problems, I'm just going to make it up anyway. We'll have weird NPCs because it'll be easy math. 50 percent is a great one. Um, it, it, it does depend on, on how you track it, though, for different reporting methods, um, which is why anytime you see any of these stories, or, or stories, journal articles, stories, um, that are using MPC in society, they always have to tell you kind of how they're basing that measure. Are they using an MPC that's very close to one? If so, somewhere in the appendix or in a footnote, they're probably going to talk about how their MPC is including debt. <coughs> that, you know, we're looking at people's purchases that they don't have an income for. If they're using an MPC that's somewhere between 0.7 and 0.8, um, they're probably saying, hey, we're looking at society's um, just what do they spend compared to what do they take in on some weekly, monthly, annually period. It's almost always annually. Um, annually period. So uh, it does kind of vary, but for the purposes of our class, I, I just wanted to give you some real life input. It's not going to make a difference in terms of our model. The other thing for our model, yeah, you can still keep doing the you know generally pretty sloped functions. That's still fine. Um, I'm not going to look at it and say, oh man, you know, somehow I'll have to get a protractor out and remember how to use a protractor from junior high to measure exactly what angle that is to see what person. I'm not going to do that. So we don't have to worry about it. Don't try to take that into a context of well, it's got to be 70%, which is kind of like this. No, I don't care. Okay, so we've got MPC now. Really briefly, there is an opposite of this, MPS. Marginal propensity to save.
And effectively, this is what percent of your income do you save? Right? Or a as income changes, how does savings change? We believe that MPC plus MPS PS, should equal one. So we've already done this. This isn't anything new. We did it in our solo model. We said, hey, you're spending 80%. That means you're saving 20%. Yeah, we still believe that to be the case. Okay, so we want to know, can we then calculate MPC? or MPS if we were so looking at that. Sure, we go back to that definition, and this is where sometimes I think that, that word definition kind of helps. We want to know, you know, what changes for each extra dollar? Or effectively, mathematically, how does consumption change as income changes? Uh, we'll use the DI. Almost did the YD like the book does, but then I would mess up my own stuff. So, how does consumption change as our disposable income changes? <coughs> so, what we want to now do is we want to be able to kind of mathematically represent that consumption function. We know that we have to include autonomous consumption. Okay, um, so I got to include A. And we know that A is going to exist even if there's no income. And if I add income, I would consume more. So that tells me I know it's A plus. All right, plus something. What, uh, what else do we have to take into account? Well, we have to take this equation into account. How much spending do we get when income changes? And I guess I also have to take into account, what is my income anyway? In essence, I need to account for the MPC, that percent of spending, times, well, what is my income? <coughs> I have an equation for C now. Whenever we, earlier in the semester, this isn't the first time we've looked at expenditure. The very first time was our circular flow, right? We had this, y equals c plus i plus g plus nx. And at the time, we said consumption's the most important, but we just said it's a given number that I can find on my Excel sheet from the Federal Reserve. Well, now we actually have a way of mathematically determining it based on society's input variables. Effectively, this now replaces C in our equation. So Y is equal to <coughs> A plus MPC DI. Don't forget DI, oh I erased it, DI has its own equation, but uh, just let's not make it too messy. Uh, the book does, they do it all messy. Plus I plus G plus all right, so we've actually done the more complex part of this model. Because now we have to think about I, G, and NX, right? I think NX is going to be the easiest one to start with. Because what is NX? NX rep represents foreign consumption, right? What do we expect? Well, we probably expect foreigners to behave the same way as domestic consumers. That meaning, meaning they, they could spend if their income was zero too, if they have wealth. So foreigners have some measure of autonomous consumption. We also tend to notice that a lot of trade exists between countries with similar MPCs. Kind of makes sense, right? We want to price the goods approximately the same um, in terms of revenue generation. 
Yeah, actually, actually, that's really true. Most industrialized nations trade with other industrialized nations. This is what, kind of what it comes down to. Which means that whatever trade partner we're going to have, while they won't have exactly the same MPC, they're going to have pretty darn close. Which means for my net exports, all I'm effectively doing is looking at some consumption function that looks very similar to what current ex currently exists in our own country. Now, it'll have a different value because people spend different amounts of money. But in essence, we could model that. We could say, all right, well, and you can hold off if you don't want to do this until we get to the end, that's fine. We know that consumption has some measure of autonomous spending. We also know that foreigners have some measure of autonomous spending. So if we took our domestic spending and their foreign spending, effectively there would be some autonomous net exports. The, just A and X, and again, you don't have to put it on there if you don't want to. And then we kind of feel their slope is probably pretty much the same, which means adding net exports to the model is just effectively a vertical shift. Um, okay, what about I? Well, first of all, is there any kind of autonomous spending for an investment? Absolutely. Firms can spend based on their previous built wealth, or more likely they're spending based on the interest rate. So we know firms are going to have some measure of autonomous spending, some I. Well, consumers greatly outspend firms. So whatever percent consumers are spending at is probably going to be the very close to the overall measured spending for all of society. Um, so I don't think I'll get too much of a slope change. But I also kind of think firms behave the same way consumers do. Meaning if they're looking at, well, things like interest rates and income, they're going to spend more income, or they're going to spend more as their income rises. And they're going to respond the same way to interest rates you do. Which means I wouldn't expect too much difference, again, in the slope for firms. Meaning all that changes is effectively just adding in whatever extra spending they have at every level. <coughs> it also is probably independent on <coughs> consumer behavior. A firm's going to spend $5,000. They don't care what you do or don't do means at every single point on the consumption function, we would just add in whatever the firm is spending. Finally, we have the government. This one is very predictable. Um, first of all, yes, the government spends when their income is zero. How do I know this? Because they have a deficit. So clearly they still spend even though they don't have that money. Okay. Um, how do they get their money? They actually get their money from consumers. That's where most of it comes from. We talked about that earlier this semester. 90-something percent of it came from consumers. 8% from firms, right? Um, yeah, so um, most of it's coming from consumers, which means that consumers base their slope of this function on their after-tax income, which means effectively the government is likely going to end up with the same slope. They're going to spend at about the same rate as consumers. And again, government spending is a very small percent relative to consumption. So it's unlikely it would be strong enough to drastically change the slope. All of them would change the slope a tiny little bit. But it's probably not going to do much, which means we would add some autonomous spending for the government, some approximate same slope, and we would get this C plus I plus G plus NX at different combinations of Y, which means we can show all spending just as a e <coughs> aggregate expenditure, the sum of all your spending, as this line with the assumption that there's some measure of autonomous spending for all units in the economy, and 
that the slope of this line is primarily driven, is approximately driven by society's marginal propensity to consume. So just kind of we'll leave it here and then, but I just want us to think about this. This will be our lead in for tomorrow. We said that, you know, y equals c plus i plus g plus nx, right? We've also said that c plus i plus g plus nx is equal to our aggregate expenditure. Can I use the transitive property here? Sure. In equilibrium, to the aggregate expenditure model, y will equal AE. At equilibrium in the aggregate expenditure model, y will equal AE. I've got a function for AE. What do I do with this term then? How do I kind of capture this y in here? That's where we'll pick up on Friday. We've actually done the breadth of the hard part of this model. So um, we'll do equilibrium, model changes, and then the math.